Welcome to Keep Smiling, the e-commerce customer experience podcast. Selling products online is challenging and can lead to poor experiences. We explore how entrepreneurs and organizations create better experiences for the people they serve. Amazon, Shopify, artificial intelligence, we'll discuss what matters today and what you can do to build a better e-commerce business. Thank you again for listening to Keep Smiling. I'm your host, Ty Walters. Michael Melgar, my typical co-host, is unable to join us today. He's on his way driving back from a holiday weekend in South Carolina. But who I do have with me today is Ryan Hamilton. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Ryan Hamilton is an associate professor of marketing at Emory University's Goizueta Business School in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a consumer psychologist whose research findings have been covered by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Harvard Business Review. He wrote a book and co-hosts a podcast, both called The Intuitive Customer, that focuses on the science that underlies great customer experiences. Ryan has never run a marathon and has no plans of ever doing so. I just ran my first marathon last year. I, as I told you before the interview, I'm into exercise science. What's the aversion to exercise? Oh, well, I lift weights. I just, uh, I don't like running and I never have. And I feel like somebody knowing that I would never under any circumstances run a marathon tells you most of what you need to know about me. And, and <laughs> I think that, that if you needed one bit of one fact, that would be the one that would tell you a lot. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Ryan. I, I want you to know I don't judge you for running that. <laughs> right? Not negatively. It's, it's fine. It's fine. They're tilted towards the masochistic end of the scale. Yes. Yes, they are. And a lot of it I can do while sitting down, which again, also. <laughs> <laughs> a creature of uh, leisure, perhaps. There you go. Ryan, what we're going to do today is spend the first half of our conversation getting to know you, your background, how you came to be a professor at a prestigious university studying consumer psychology, and and what makes you tick, including maybe your exercise habits. And in the second half, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into some of the works that you've created, some of the books that you've authored, and the research and the work that you're doing today as it pertains to consumer behavior, customer psychology, and maybe how we can translate some of those lessons and principles for our audience who are e-commerce merchants, business owners that are running an e-commerce store, selling their products online, or professionals in customer service. Uh, They're working for another company. They have a customer facing role. They're battling day to day with angry, dissatisfied, and sometimes satisfied customers. So hopefully we can give them some advice, something to add to their toolkit in terms of how to become a better customer service agent. That sounds great. Ryan, let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your origin story, where you grew up, how you developed, and what shaped some of your earlier experiences that provided the foundation of what you do today. Sure. Um, So I I grew up, I was born in Southern California, and then we moved away from there when I was 10 to Ohio. Uh, where I lived just long enough to become a lifelong Browns fan and suffer the consequences of that oh, yeah. every season. This is our year, though. Um, finally, don't check back with me at the end of the season on that, but this is our year. <laughs> um, lived in the Cleveland area and then uh, moved to Arizona to finish out high school. So kind of bounced around, lived in various different places in the country. Um, my dad was a, a teacher, was a public high school teacher. I think that... Uh, in terms of motivations and what led me towards wanting to teach as a profession. I think that was definitely part of it. I studied physics in high school so or in, in college. So there's not, there's not a, like a real short linear map between how I got from where I was to being a marketing professor. I studied physics because I found it interesting, but didn't really want to go into it professionally. So I, I worked in a few kind of odd jobs, computer programming. I worked for a, a political campaign at one point. And it wasn't until I'd worked several years that I actually started to to get into marketing and and decision making. I was trying to figure out what could I stay interested in for the next, you know, 40 years of my working life. Uh, And the questions that were most interesting to me in in business were those that that surrounded how people make decisions, uh, what causes people to choose one one option over another. Until when I decided to go back to, to graduate school, 
that's where I focused and uh, went to uh, uh, the Kellogg School at Northwestern to get my PhD, studied uh, psychology there and marketing, and then ended up at, uh, at Emory. I, I married a, a Southerner. And so she crossed off large portions of the map as being unlivably cold. Uh, <laughs> I was lucky enough to get a good job in one of the few areas that she deemed acceptably warm. She still complains about the winters here in Atlanta, but we're, we're generally happy pretty, pretty much here. That's amazing. Uh, as you know, I lived in Georgia for a little bit, a few years ago, but I'm born and raised in Wisconsin and Atlanta is crazy hot for me. So it, it is not a joke. People who have not been to Atlanta, it, they are not kidding. Um, right. People talk about the heat here. And apparently that's like you stated, that's not even the warmest part of the state. The, the farther you get south towards the ocean, the worse it gets, especially during the summer. So let's go back to the Browns comment. I really hope they have a great season because they have been abysmal. A couple winless seasons back to back, but Baker Mayfield really seems like the real deal. So I hope he turns the program around there. I mean, we're, we're in this terrible place where, you know, you can't stop hoping. And yet at the same time, it's been hard. It's been hard. I, I mean, one story that I, I tell sometimes my students, you know, I was a Browns fan, but I lived in other parts of the country which you, means you can't watch Browns games because nobody there, you know, there's like one nationally televised Browns game per year, which makes a lot of good business sense for the networks, by the way. Right. Um, but, you know, if you live in, in Arizona or Utah or California, you can't watch Browns games. So I got my first job, you know, postgraduate school at Emory and direct TV had this very expensive NFL package. And I was thinking, Oh, this is amazing. I actually have an income now. I could pay for this and watch these Browns games. Like I used to when I was a kid, that'd be so great. I lived there, by the way, during the Bernie Kosar era, which is like the one one small slice in time when the Browns were actually making it to the playoffs regularly. And I think that's part of why I was corrupted and, and ended up loving them. They had two free weeks under this expensive cable package. And so I watched the games during those first two weeks and it was just so painful. <laughs> but why would I pay to do this to myself every week? So I didn't end up buying the package. Uh, well, from what I take from your being a Browns fan, I think it's that you're not a flip flopper. You're not a bandwagon fan. You believe in something and you stick through it even when it's difficult. So clearly I'm loyal because there is no other possible reason to be a Browns fan. You mentioned decision making and you were trying to find something that would be interesting to you for a long time. I felt the same way at certain times in my life. We need to find a career or a field that is maybe deep enough and, and rich enough that it's going to hold our attention, especially someone like you who's gifted academically and maybe has a really high IQ. It, it takes interesting, more complicated problems, I'm assuming, to keep you interested. Can you talk to us more about why decision making? Why did that catch your interest? I mean, it's a good question. I don't know that I've got a great answer for it. I mean, it was fascinating to me. So some of the stuff that we study in decision making, the specific areas of decision making that I'm interested in are, are what might be classified as cold cognition. So the idea there's warm cognition, which deals a lot with kind of the emotional reactions. And, and I certainly will, will dabble my toes in that and, I, and I'll read about it. But the stuff that is most interesting to me is, is this cold cognition stuff, which is kind of the rules that, that people follow and break when they make decisions. So I got interested in an area of decision making called behavioral decision theory. Sometimes it's, it's called the heuristics and biases. Um, so all of the, the Kahneman and Tversky stuff, if you're a researcher or if your listeners are familiar with them, these very subtle framing effects and context effects that change people's decision making in ways that logically, rationally, they shouldn't. I, I guess part of what I enjoyed about the research field was the fact that I get to constantly be surprised by it. You know, I'll, I'll still, I'll go to conferences and, and you know I'm if you include PhD days, I'm I'm a good, you know, 15, 20 years into this profession at this point. And I will go to research conferences and see somebody presenting some of their research. And, you know, not infrequently I'll I'll just say, that's really amazing. Like that's really cool that people will act in this weird way uh, that that you wouldn't anticipate, that you wouldn't expect. And that to me is, is different about the study of decision making than the study of a lot of things. Uh, as I said, I, I was very interested in, in physics uh, as an undergrad and I worked in a research lab. I actually got to run a, a proton accelerator, which is kind of the coolest job on campus. Uh, we would fire beams of protons at things and then 
test the x-ray scatter that would come off of it. And you could tell what elements were, were inside the sample. It was, it was a really cool, fun job. The professors that I worked with, the chemistry professor and a physics professor, they would get so excited about the results of this. Like, can you believe there's 12% zinc in this sample? <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's what I wanted. Like I, I wanted something that was that exciting to me and that interesting to me. And they had found it, you know, bless them. They had found this thing that they were just, we'd hold these research meetings and, and they would be so excited about these small differences in elemental samples. And that, that's what I wanted. I wanted to find something that would hold my attention uh, in that way. And I, and I think it's different for a lot of people. Um, for me, it was just, you know, decision-making was what kind of sparked my interest. And then I was able to, lucky enough to, to be able to dig into this stuff and continue to find things that are super interesting and surprising to me. That's a powerful story. I've spoke, spoken to several people about this topic in terms of being inspired by a very oh, enthusiastic teacher or professor at some stage in their academic journey. Sometimes it's as early as middle school. Sometimes that doesn't happen until college. And um, But it's it's an example that so many people point to to say, this is why, or this is this is what really made it clear for me. And hopefully uh, at this stage, and I'm sure you are, you're providing that example for the students that you're working with. And we're going to talk more about that coming up here. You mentioned that your father was a teacher. Do you feel that he exemplified some of that enthusiasm and energy? And, and what topic or subject did he teach? He, I, I mean, he, he loved it more than, than anything. So he taught, um, I'm not sure what the current um, appropriate phrase is, but he, he taught what at that point was called the learning disability class. So it was students who struggled academically. Um, and he taught in a very rough high school in, in L.A., and he loved it. He eventually ended up taking some computer night classes. And when we moved to Ohio, he left the teaching profession. And, you know, my understanding is he did it largely for economic reasons. Um, I was I'm the oldest of five kids. And it was just, it was very tough to support a family on a public high school teacher's salary uh, in Southern California at that time. And so I'm, it still is. And so uh, he moved on and, and did a job that, you know, I, I think he still enjoyed, but I also think he enjoyed less. I think he found it very fulfilling to work with people and help them understand things and, and meet them where they were. And, and so I didn't decide I wanted to be a teacher when I was very young. And part of it was because I saw, you know, how financially difficult it was for my parents. But, you know, somebody, <laughs> when I was thinking about going back to graduate school, I talked to a marketing professor who's friends of my in-laws. And he said, listen, if you're, if you're thinking about doing this, you should, because being a business school professor is society's last great loophole. Um, you get this great job and you get you know, the opportunity to you know, be your own boss. I, I call being a research professor entrepreneurship for sissies. Because uh, we, we get to set our own agenda. We get to do whatever we want to. At the same time, we're still pulling a, a check every month. Um, so it's it's all of the upsides of entrepreneurship and and few of the downsides. Um, so it's it's great. I, I feel lucky every day that I've I've fallen into this where I get to research topics that I'm genuinely interested in about and excited about, and also that I get to teach people uh, in part using some of these research and in part about just topics that I'm interested and passionate about, uh, and that I get to do both and that I get to switch off. I, I worry that I would get bored doing just one. So it's, yeah, I feel very, very lucky. Interesting. It really sounds like you found your niche in that regard in terms of harnessing that academic side with the example of your father and, and the, the proton accelerator days, but then at the same time, providing an answer for that economic situation, like you stated before. Ryan, I, I need to mention that the more I researched you and, and what you do in this field in general, it, it sort of feels like you're training to become a Jedi. And what I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Star Wars, but there's that Jedi mind trick, right, where they wave their hand and you can instantly change someone's mind. Or, and, and really what you're researching seems to be not far from it because you're researching and understanding what makes 
people make a decision. And as we're going to speak about, there are so many things that when you tweak the situation, you alter it this way or that way, the decision becomes different. And it happens in a, a, a reliable way and in a pattern. This all leads me to think that the most skilled people in your profession are just really persuasive. They can make people think and behave um, as they see fit. <laughs> am, am I far off? Does this seem like, do you feel like you're persuasive? So, no, this is, this is a great question. The answer is definitively going to be no. <laughs> like the, the, there's the old saw about people researching stuff they're bad at. It's true of decision researchers, too. There, you know, I've got colleagues who are just brilliant brilliant, brilliant decision researchers. And you go out to eat with them and it'll take them 45 minutes to figure out what they want from the menu. (laughs) Um, The the science of decision-making is endlessly fascinating. Let me, let me put it this way. There's been this resurgence in interest around behavioral economics, you know, the thinking fast and slow became a bestseller, predictably irrational became a bestseller. Uh, And businesses have started to pick up on this and try to apply it. And a lot of them have been really frustrated buy it. So they get very excited about these ideas and then they'll go out and they'll try to apply them and they won't work or they won't work well. And part of that is because it's really complicated to actually implement in real life. So when we look for something scientifically, um, what we're generally doing is isolating that phenomenon from everything else. So I use a lot of experiments. I and mean, most of this research is done using experiments. You have two very similar situations. One might be described in terms of losses. One might be described in terms of gains, but it's equivalent information. And then you randomly assign people to get one version or the other. And then you can find a difference in how they react to those two things. That tells us a lot about kind of the theory of decision-making. And it shows us how people are maybe acting in surprising ways in response to those two different things. Now, when you go out to apply that in the real world, that may still be scientifically true, but now we're suddenly in this very noisy environment where in addition to that one, I don't want to say the word true, theories are never true, but that accurate theory, that that theory that's useful is also now in an environment where there are dozens of other also accurate theories that are now coming into play. And so there's a view of this research where, you know, the end goal or the end result is the Manchurian candidate, where we can like program someone against their will to buy certain things or act in certain ways or or make certain decisions. And every once in a while, we can find examples of just huge shifts in preference based on very small interventions. Um, there's one that's appeared in several TED Talks, a research paper by Eric Johnson, where they found, for example, a, a huge difference in organ donation rates in Europe based on whether uh, people opt into those programs or opt out of them. So check this box to be an organ donor or check this box to not be an organ donor. And people think that all of decision research is like that. And the reality is most of it is not. Most of it is, is good research that tells us something very specific about people in a very specific set of situations. But if we want to take that and then apply it more broadly... We have to respect kind of all of the decision making research and try to figure out how it all fits together. And that's just much more complex. So the reality is most decision researchers suffer from focalism, which is a decision bias that we research where we become enamored of some certain set of theories. And then we go out and over apply them when we try to help them people when we consult or when we try to figure things out. So whereas you think that we might be these like Jedi mind manipulators, Mm -hmm. the fact is we're usually just as biased as everyone else and over apply and narrowly focus on some hobby horse set of theories that we care about or that we developed ourselves um, and therefore end up not being all that much better at prediction or persuasion in a kind of naturalistic context than a lot of other people. So how's that for shooting my profession in the foot? On the contrary, Ryan, I think it's an excellent explanation of the nuance of science. Like you said, there's a difference between the lab and the real world, but that doesn't make the lab unuseful. It has to be understood in the proper context. And like you said, you couldn't conduct science in a noisy environment, but the noisy environment is the reality of of the day-to-day situations that we're attempting to understand. So I, I think you did an excellent job there. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that that came through and that we're on the same page on that. I, again, I'm not trying to denigrate the scientific work that we do. It just serves a different purpose than I think 
a lot of the people who are interested in the science want it to serve, right? It's still useful. It still tells us something about people. It still helps us make better predictions on the whole. Um, but we need to be very careful in how we use it. Um, you can think of it as, as kind of a mosaic or almost like a, a stained glass window where each theory is bounded by these leaded panes and works really well within that specific domain. But then as soon as you cross those domains, cross those boundaries, now there's a different theory that maybe applies better. So part of understanding the science of decision-making is understanding lots of these different theories and then also the boundaries where they apply. When we read Thinking Fast and Slow and go, oh, this is a, a great insight, this is you know great science, and then we try to apply it, well, we may be applying it outside of the boundaries of that theory. Um, and th this is this is an insight that, that took me 12 years of working with this stuff every day to kind of get straight in my own head. So, um, yeah, this is one of the topics I'm interested now in, in terms of teaching and consulting and other things where I'm, I'm trying to help people understand what took me a long time to get. That science is great, but science is not magic. Uh, and we need to kind of understand the ways that it'll be useful so that we can get the most out of it. Ryan, in your audio book that I listened to recently, uh, How You Decide the Science of Human Decision Making, you talk a little bit about some of the research you conducted. In the example you gave that's coming to mind, you were asking students about a price they would pay for a pen and examining some of that. I don't know how old that research is or if it's still a current line today. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the specific work and research that you've done in the field and, and maybe what you're involved with today? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So. As a marketing professor, um, my research involves consumer decision making, um, which, uh, again, is kind of this entrepreneurship model I can take in, in almost any direction that I'm interested in. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested in usually questions re related to, to price and related to branding. Um, those are kind of two areas that I'm interested in frequently. So the paper that you're referring to was one about pricing. And it was an idea that came from my, my co-author on that paper, Jeff Larson, who's a professor at uh, Brigham Young University. And, and he had this idea that, you know, people might be more or less sensitive to quality differences around price boundaries. So if you set a, a price restraint on yourself, like if you go to the store and say, okay, I'm going to buy a watch, but I'm not going to spend any more than a hundred dollars on this watch. Uh, or if you set a, a price range, like I'm going to buy a TV, but uh, I'm going to be looking in the, you know, 150 to $200 range we hypothesize that that could change the nature of the way people make decisions if you set one of these restraints on you. And in talking through what, the, what would happen there, we came to the conclusion that, that it could actually increase the amount people spent relative to they didn't. So, so again, going back to the idea that this decision research can be surprising or, or delightful in terms of, of being counterintuitive, that was what drew me to this particular project as Jeff and I were talking through it. You know, we worked through kind of the theory of what would be happening there. And we came to this very surprising conclusion and we went, ooh, that would be really fun. Let's see if we can find that. Can setting a price restraint on yourself actually backfire and cause you to spend more? Mm. And we found that it can. Um, and so what happens is, imagine you're going to go in and buy a TV. And so you walk into the store and you see all the, um, or, or since, you know, e-commerce, we can, we can put this on a website. It should work the same way. You go to the website and you see, you know, there are six or eight TVs that kind of meet your general criteria. And now you're choosing among them. And among the evaluations that you're making are, is each of these options worth the price I'm paying? And this TV that costs $30 more, is it worth $30 more than this other one that costs $30 less? So you're making all these trade-offs. And that's kind of a complicated process. And you'll end up making a decision. Mm -hmm. Now let's suppose that you, you go to the same website and you've already decided I'm not going to spend any more than $200 on this TV. And you see these, the same set of TVs that all kind of meet your general needs, but some of them are above 200 and some are below 200. And now you've got these same two TVs that are separated by $30 price difference. Only now you've already decided everything under $200 is acceptable, right? Cause you've already set that limit for yourself. And so now you're dealing with a higher quality TV that is acceptable at a higher price and a lower quality TV that's also acceptable at a lower price. But price has now already kind of been checked off. We've already taken care of that. And so we argue that anything under the price boundary that you set for yourself, you're mostly just focusing on quality differences. And so that's going to lead people on average to spend more money to pay more for stuff than they otherwise would have without a set of price restraints. And so we tested that in, 
in various studies, including giving people money and letting them buy a pen from us. And, uh, and we found that people who said to themselves, I'm not going to spend any more than $2 on a pen ended up spending more than people who just went in and looked at the pens first without setting that limit on themselves. If I could say that back to you to see if I understand when the metric or the aspect characteristic, whatever of price is considered beforehand. In this case, you saw that the research participants over indexed or, or thought about other characteristics more. In this case, it was quality. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and again, going back to this idea about boundaries, does this mean that you should never set like a price limit on yourself before you go shopping? And the answer to that is no. Right. So the, the domains that we tested this in, for example, looked at, at single purchases. So you're going to go in and buy a TV or buy a watch or you know, a mattress or whatever else, a pen. And we found in situations like that, pretty consistently, people ended up spending more. We think we didn't test this, but the theory that we developed suggests this effect would break down if it was an entire list of stuff. So if you go grocery shopping and say, I don't want to spend any more than $100 on this trip, we don't think you'll end up necessarily spending more than if you had not set a price limit on yourself. So again, I have confidence in the findings that we, that we found, the, the research that we developed there, but I also don't think that it explains everything about shopper behavior and that it should be best understood within a set of, of boundaries, as should all theories. The situation that Michael and I, my business partner, come across is, of course, more e-commerce. So Amazon sellers or selling physical products on your own website. And the way that many sellers think about Amazon is sort of a rudimentary model of sales in terms of that, well, if my awareness is greater, so I'm hitting page one with my products, or I'm at the top of page one, or if I'm advertising, and if I have the lower price, my sales will just increase. Of course, there's a whole set of different environmental conditions in this case, but it's interesting and encouraging for me to hear that there's so many other things at play. What is the customer coming to your product detail page with? Do they expect a price? And if they do, are you, are you advertising that quality on your page? If you can rationalize the quality, they might pay more. You don't have to be the lowest price item to compete online. I mean, what, what you are, I mean, you're not using these terms, but what you are, are articulating here is, look, your clients, they have a theory. Right? They have a theory of how their customers are making decisions mm -hmm. and it might be accurate. More often, it'll be accurate within some set of boundaries. I mean, we can look at this from a, a segmentation and targeting perspective too. This is another type of theoretical boundary as, as applies to marketing. But if you've got different groups of customers, they may, you may need different theories of decision-making for each of them. And then based on the theory, can you, can you test it? Can you, you know, Mm -hmm. Do in fact sales go up when you do nothing more than get to the top of the page and lower your price? Okay. Could sales go up more if you do a better job of justifying the quality of your offering in an, you know, an intuitive way so people see that it's worth the extra price? All of these are based on different theories or models that you as the marketer have developed about your customer. And when I teach customer psychology, I try to push my students on that. You know, are you articulating your theories? Um, are, you, are you telling yourself? you know, just as you did to me, are you explaining the process as you see it so that you can then refine your theories and actually test them instead of just blindly believing that they're true and acting on them and not looking for evidence to disprove your assumptions and kind of refine and improve your theory and make them better. Ryan, thank you for bringing that up. I, I wanted to understand what type of professor you were in the classroom. If I were to take one of your classes at Emory, what would my opinion be of you? What would I think about Professor Ryan Hamilton? You just mentioned urging your students to articulate theories. It sounds like you're attempting to motivate them to be skeptical, to not assume anything. Would that be the case? Would I come away from your class questioning everything that I believe in? <laughs> Probably not. Um, it's, it's not a philosophy class. Um, I teach generally mostly two classes. I, I teach the, what's known as the core. So it's the required marketing class for all of our incoming MBA students. And then sometimes I also teach a consumer psychology elective, which the, the audio book you listen to about decision making uh, was drawn largely from that course. In terms of, of what students can expect, when I'm teaching marketing, I tend to focus on kind of the big ideas or the basics. And honestly, I, I think that there are students who can be disappointed by that, who come to MBA school 
thinking that they're going to get kind of the latest cutting edge, you know, social media platforms or, you know, search engine optimization techniques. And, and in my view, those things are really, really important. But most of the problems that happen in business are from people not doing the basics. So when I, when I teach this introductory marketing course, I give people my three question definition of marketing. And I, I explain to them that marketing is about answering three questions. Who is your customer? What do they value or how are they making their decisions? And then how can you give them what they value better than the competition? And those are really high level abstract ideas. And yet they are, they are so core to everything else we do. It's a shame when people optimize their price, for example, without knowing who their target customer is, because the same price will be too high, too low, or just right, depending on which group of customers you're going after. And it takes me, you know, most of a semester to kind of break people out of this rush to tactics and really kind of point out that they need to take a step back and develop a strategy first. So in most of my courses, it, it is kind of a process of putting on the brakes and, and encouraging people to think larger and more abstractly about problems rather than running straight to solutions, which, you know, you get a, a bunch of hard charging MBA students in there who I love. I love teaching MBA students. I think that they're great. They, they tend to be very engaged and they, they're very challenging, and, but they want information about, you know, what can I use tomorrow? What could I really get in there? And then, so I, I push back against that. I try to encourage them to, to think more broadly because I think there's more opportunity there in business. Uh, you can learn the search engine optimization tools and all of the tactics about the latest social media platforms after you get the basics down. So in terms of teaching philosophy, I think that that's my biggest goal as a teacher. Mm. You mentioned rush to tactics. We see that in, in our space all the time. There's oh, a I new bet tactic. you do. Like, <laughs> that does not surprise me at all. The validity of those tactics is is neither here nor there. Sometimes they're great, but yeah, it's the reason why I really like your approach and why we brought you on the podcast today is is exactly this point. Not exactly this point, but it's it's one of the points that take a step back. Let's think about the basics of human psychology and human behavior, because at the end of the day, your buyers, your customers are people and we need to understand how they're thinking and behaving and then let's talk about your marketing plan or then or then let's talk about why you're setting your price there or what description should go on your detail page. So I'm really glad we're talking about this. Ryan, let's move ahead. We, we mentioned your audiobook, and we're going to provide links to that in the show notes. I'm going to introduce um, something that your book inspired me to find on my bookshelf. And right now I'm holding a book called Free Will by Sam Harris. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist and philosopher. And um, the quote from the book goes like this. What I will do next and why remains at bottom a mystery, one that is fully determined by the prior state of the universe and the laws of nature, including the contributions of chance. To declare my, quote, freedom is tantamount to saying, quote, I don't know why I did it, but it's the sort of thing I tend to do and I don't mind doing it. This quote jumped out at me. And I thought about this book as I was reading and listening to your books, because what they share in my mind is they're both getting at this sort of black box nature of the human psyche or, or of cognition, if you will. There is a certain aspect where we don't know exactly why we do what we do or who we are. But then there's this other part, maybe the tip of the iceberg, where we do have a, a conscious self. And, and I do know who Ty Walters is. And, and, and I think I know that with a degree of certainty. Free will aside, this theme comes up in, in your audiobook and in your physical book, The Intuitive Customer. You talk about the two system theory, and maybe you have a, a more precise word for that, where there's this newer aspect of our mind where, where we can do math and we can plan and rationalize. But then there's this more primal aspect to ourselves or our consciousness that is instinctual and, and emotional. Can you talk a little bit about that two system theory and, and how that informs what you do today? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So this is an idea that's gotten very big in behavioral economics. And then a lot of people who have gotten excited about behavioral economics, a lot of people who apply these ideas in their businesses have, have really latched onto this as, as something new and cool. The reality is it's not new. It's a very old idea. Uh, Aristotle talked about the soul versus the mind and Freud talked about the id versus the ego. These ideas have been kicking around in philosophy and psychology for hundreds of years. 
but it's it keeps coming back and it's currently seeing a resurgence in part because it's such an interesting way of looking at human behavior. But the basic idea, as you pointed out, is we've got multiple mental systems that drive our behavior. So we've got multiple cognitive systems that contribute to decisions, to evaluations, uh, to choices that we make. And the influence of this automatic hidden system may be surprisingly important. They may really influence us a lot. You've got people at one end, uh, like, like Harris, who you quoted, uh, John Barge, who's a social psychologist at Yale, is another, um, who make claims uh, saying that all or nearly everything that we do is driven by these automatic processes and uh, non-conscious behavior. We're, we're not consciously aware of anything, and so free will is an illusion. Uh, I will say that even within psychology, uh, that's kind of a minority position. Uh, again, taking nothing away from these great researchers who have evidence to back up their positions. It's still not the mainstream view, I think. I think uh, most people in the decision science space still believe in free will to a certain extent, that we, you know, the conscious mind still can assert its will, can assert its, its choices, preferences. But there is also definitely evidence that, you know, some non-trivial amount of our behavior is driven by these non-conscious habitual or automatic processes and the way we interact with our environment in a non-conscious way. Two-system model, if you're interested in it, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is a, is a great kind of overview. Uh, he was very influential in a lot of this original research. I will point out one of the ways that people often get two-system thinking wrong when they try to apply it. Some people come away from this exposure to the idea of two systems in thinking that, oh, therefore, system two, the, the rational system doesn't matter, and that we should just focus on this old, intuitive, instinctual system one. And, and that, I think, is not correct. I think it's most useful to think about the way that these two systems interact. So most of the, uh, the decisions we make have some kind of rational component to them and some intuitive, instinctual component to them. Um, and so I, when I teach this, I've tried to define several of the ways that these things work together. Um, I won't walk, walk you through all of them, but I'll, I'll introduce you to a couple just to kind of get you um, clear with the idea. So imagine that you are walking down the street and you pass an ice cream shop. Your intuitive automatic system one will almost always be encouraging you to stop and get ice cream. That's, that's the part of our mind where all of our base urges and desires exist. If you're, if you're Freudian, this is the id is overlaps with our concept of system one. System two is where all of our higher order goals reside, like, you know, wanting to maintain a diet, knowing we've got to run a marathon tomorrow if we're you, um, knowing that we don't have to run a marathon tomorrow and therefore we can't afford to eat all those calories if you're me. Um, <laughs> but that system one is saying we should, we should do that. System two now has this choice of, you know, you've got all of a sudden this urge to buy ice cream, to eat ice cream. What do you do with that urge? Well, you could approve it. So you get this urge and then that kind of bubbles up to conscious thought and you go, yeah, I should get ice cream. No, let's, let's go do that. Um, so I, I call that approval. So we've got this system one that's encouraging us to do something and system two says yes. Or system two could override that. Could say, no, no, no. Uh, I feel this urge. I know that I want to eat ice cream, but I'm not going to do it because I've, I'm on a diet or, or for whatever other reason. There's also though this in, interesting place um, that I call neglect, which is where system two doesn't have the resources to override system one. So you've got this intuitive desire to do something, but you've had this exhausting day at work or you're super distracted by thinking about other things. Our, our rational mind can only do a few things at the same time and it can become tired in the short run. And in cases like that, we can um, fail to override these base urges. This would be the Freudian slip right? Or this would be, you know, just kind of breaking down and, and cheating on your diet at the end of a long day. So I call that neglect, where system two neglects to override or oversee system one. And then we go and, and do what we're not supposed to do. We, we buy the ice cream. Now, I feel like this is a more useful way of thinking about these two systems. So it's not just that system one is always in charge. This intuition automatic process is always there and in charge. 
it's always providing us the urge to do various things. System one always wants ice cream, but we don't always get ice cream. And, and I think it's useful to understand that as the inner to, interplay of these two systems. Sometimes we get ice cream and it's because we've decided that that's what we want. And we kind of approve that. Sometimes it's because we don't have the, the will to overcome our urge to get ice cream. And so we get it, even though we feel guilty about it while we're doing it. And we wish we wouldn't. Sometimes we don't get ice cream at all. So I encourage people who are interested in this to think about these two systems in this way. It's not that that we can just, you know, ignore the rational mind because it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it does. Uh, and we can't just ignore the intuitive system and pretend that people are hyper-rational all the time because people are not. But the beauty of these two system models is that they allow for the flexibility of explaining a lot of different outcomes based on the relative influence of these, uh, these two systems, these two sets of processes working together. So that's my pitch for a more in-depth approach to understanding this, this very popular psychological model. Ryan, as you were explaining that, it, what came to mind from a class way back in the day was this chariot allegory, if you've heard of yeah. it. So just to describe that quicker, maybe you could in, in better words, but Plato said, the mind is like a chariot. You have the carriage drawn by the horses, which is the subconscious mind. It's, it's strong and powerful, but it also requires the driver. And without both interacting, the chariot is useless. Is that sort of summarize how you view this? Very good. Yeah. So there's this, this metaphor employed by the ancient Greeks, this, these philosophers, and they said that you as a human um, are a chariot driver and you've got these two horses that are pulling this chariot. And one of the horses is, is noble and rational. This is like your kind of roughly equivalent to your system two or your rational mind. And the other one is emotional and, and has all these base impulses. And um, I've never driven a chariot, but presumably this is a more common experience back then. And the idea is that these two horses are always trying to go in different directions. And so you, as the person who has both of these systems, both of these horses, your job is to get them both going in the same direction. And, you know, Plato and Aristotle, they, they would tell you that, you know, you should listen to, to the rational horse and try to suppress your emotions. I think that modern psychologists wouldn't say that that's always the case. We know that emotions can be very useful in decision making and can uh, actually improve certain types of decision making. Uh, but it is the case that that often these two systems will want to go in different directions. And so you need to kind of negotiate that. Now, those who think that we have no free will would kind of reject that metaphor. They'd say, no, no, there's just the intuitive horse. And then we just pretend that there's another horse there as a way of explaining what this horse that we can't see is doing. That metaphor made a lot more sense before I started saying it out loud. Uh, <laughs> we have to get into like invisible horses now in order to make this work. They, they, they would essentially argue there's no kind of internal conflict. It's all driven by intuition on automatic processes. And then rational thinking is just a story that we tell ourselves afterwards. Again, not necessarily the mainstream view. Also not a view that, that is without support. So, I mean, there is evidence that some of the stuff that we do, maybe a lot of the stuff that we do, happens very automatically and that um, we kind of tell ourselves stories afterwards. So I'm not trying to tell you that that, that approach is wrong or that people who believe that are, are in error. I do think though that the science is still being developed and we're still discovering things kind of on both sides around that. Thank you for taking that metaphor on. So Ryan, I, I discovered one of your videos. It was from CX Talks Atlanta 2018. And you talk about this concept of reference points. One of the quotes in that video was, People can't evaluate anything without a reference point. And of course, I'm taking that out of context. But this resonates with our understanding of customer service. There's a lot of gurus out there, a lot of thought leaders saying that, listen, your customer service needs to be on point. And the reason is because they're not comparing you to another smaller to medium-sized e-commerce seller. They're comparing you to Zappos and to Airbnb, wherever else they're getting customer service online. What's your opinion? Is this true? Or do we have to be as good as the best when it comes to online customer service? I will encourage you to think about reference points. So I, I don't want to make a bold statement that absolutely all of your web interactions or all of your customers, you know, e-commerce transactions are immediately and automatically compared to Amazon. What is important for you to figure out is what are those reference points? So what are they comparing you to? there's a decent chance that people are comparing your e-commerce site to Amazon. 
just because so many people shop at Amazon for so many things, it's a natural reference point, but not necessarily, uh, right? And, and so you should figure that out, but you know that they're comparing it to something. And that's kind of the, the big idea. When I have 15 minutes to talk to a group of, of business leaders about psychology, about the influence of psychology, often I will use that 15 minutes to talk about reference points because I just think it's, it's so useful as a way of understanding customers and of framing interventions and figuring out how you can do things better. Can you figure out what those reference points are? Can you change their reference points? Um, can you improve reference points? I, I mean, I'll give you a real simple pricing example. The Neiman Marcus company will put out this Christmas catalog every year. And uh, famously, one of the first things you see when you open the catalog is something outrageously expensive. So they've sold, uh, I think it was a Jaguar, some sports car that was covered in Savorsky crystals, so like a, a crystal car. Uh, they sold a personal submarine that you could buy. It's like, I don't know, two or $3 million. You can buy this, this one man submarine. Uh, they sold, you know, uh, uh, oh, they sold an actual mummy in a sarcophagus, like a real Egyptian mummy. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there are many reasons why they do this. Some of this is just kind of branding. It generates buzz. You can, you can find newspaper articles that are written about this. Um, I, I thought it was mostly for that reason. It turns out they do sell out of these things every year. So there's somebody who bought a mummy in a catalog um, mm -hmm. and had it delivered to their home. So they, they do sell these things, but it also, and, and there've been researchers who have documented this using experiments. It also provides a reference point for people. So when you see, you know, a $3 million submarine at the beginning of a catalog, then a few pages later, when you get to the $400 bathrobes, you're like, Oh no, that's reasonable. Right. So that there are ways that you can nudge people's reference points around in ways that make your experience or, or your offering more or less favorable. So do you know what your customer's reference points are? What are they comparing you to? A lot of times we assume people's reference points are defined very narrowly within our category, right? So I'm selling replacement roofs. So I think of my competition as other roof sellers in my area. And that's who I'm focused on. That may or may not be your customer's reference point, right? If they do extensive uh, research before they contact you, then yeah, they may know what all of your competitors' prices are and they may see how their websites, you know, provide them information. On the other hand, if you're the first one that they contact, their reference points may be, you know, the last time they had work done on the house. So they may be comparing you to plumbers or to electricians. If they're going to your website, they may be comparing you to other informative shopping websites that they go to, right? So they may be comparing you to Zappos or somewhere else where they feel like they can go and get good information about the product that they're about to buy. Do you know that? Can you figure that out? Can you figure out what people are comparing your website to, your e-commerce platform to, your advertising to, so that you have some idea of how you can improve it? If you assume, oh, we only need a better e-commerce platform than, you know, other roof replacement services and we're clearly better than them, then we should be great. And people aren't comparing you to Amazon or Zappos, then you're losing, even if you think you're winning in the category. Right. So it's not just about reference points, but perhaps the reference points that your customers are using that you, you may or may not even be aware of at the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes back to this boundary question, right? Different customers will have different reference points that are bringing to use in making their evaluations, but you know they're using something. So what is it? Ryan, I want to end today by bringing back to customer experience. This is Keep Smiling, the e-commerce customer experience podcast. And in your book, The Intuitive Customer, you define customer experience and allow me to read that. A customer experience is a customer's perception of their rational, physical, emotional, subconscious, and psychological interaction with any part of an organization these perceptions influence customer behaviors and build memories, which drive customer loyalty and thereby affect the economic value an organization generates. I really enjoy that definition of customer experience. It's different than others I've seen out there, but I think it offers a little bit more. Ryan, if you don't mind, talk to us about what you feel is a good customer experience. And if you have an example as a consumer or a customer yourself, when have you had a really great customer experience? And in your mind, what made it so great? Yeah, I, one thing to remember, especially those who are focused on kind of e-commerce, two bits of advice that I would give. First, you know, focus on the tools that you have available to you. So 
there are certain types of customer interactions where, you know, you can focus on like employees that are smiling or not smiling or kind of the tone of voice. If you're dealing with an e-commerce platform, you have a more limited set of tools to deal with, but you still have things that you can do. So go ahead and articulate those, list those out. Like what are the things that I can do to make a customer experience on my website better or worse? And then make sure that you are doing everything you can within those domains to improve. A second bit of advice is I would say, know what your goals are in terms of customer experience. So this goes back a little bit to, to who your target customer is. But um, I like being able to not interact with people in a sales environment. So there are a lot of people who complained about the self-checkouts at grocery stores. I love that. I don't need to stop listening to the podcast that I'm listening to so that I can exchange small talk. I can just you know zap a few items and be out on my way. And it was great. There are other people who very much enjoy that part of the customer experience. These are two different segments. Who do you serve? Do you know what they want? So, you know, some customers may want more information on the website. Some customers may consider that kind of clutter and distraction and want less information. Who do you serve? What is your customer and and what do they want? Because that's how you optimize your customer experience on the web. The last bit is recognize that from your perspective within a business, you know, you have all of these silos, um, these different divisions, but from the customer's standpoint, it's all seen as part of one part of the same whole. And so if you optimize your web experience, your customer's web experience, but they have a terrible experience at the in-store location, then you're going to net out at a loss, right? Or if they have a terrible experience at the, the phone center when they call. So as important as it is for you to do great within your domain in an organization, make sure that you're thinking broadly about this and integrate with the other parts of the organization and and try to have kind of a global experience strategy because your customers are going to be evaluating the experience with your brand globally. Thank you so much, Ryan. I really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like our audience is going to get a lot of value out of this coming from the academic side of decision making. And thank you so much for sharing not only your background, but what you're investigating today and and what interests you today. As a merchant and as a seller, I urge you to take in this information. Ryan's offered a lot of great things to think about. Take that step back, that wide angle view, determine what your goals are, and then implement changes and test because it's all in the data. You could have an idea or an assumption about something, but if the data doesn't support that, it's um, pretty useless. Ryan, if people wanted to get in contact with you, you've directed us to take a look at your book and I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. Again, the title is The Intuitive Customer. You're the co-author on that with Colin Shaw. Also, if you'd like to hear Ryan, check out his podcast. You can find that at beyondphilosophy.com forward slash podcasts or anywhere podcasts are available. Through the podcast is how I was initially introduced to Ryan. And I just really enjoy the mind that he brings to customer experience. And the interaction with him and Colin is very uh, entertaining and useful as well. So take a look. Ryan, final question here. This is from my fiance, who's in the health sciences. She says, are we allowed to send Ryan a survey once per month asking if he will run a marathon one day? Uh, You can. In fact, you can batch the next 12 months and send them all to me. (laughs) Um, And and we save us both a lot of time. I mean, I will say I don't I don't run marathons. I do carbo load, though, as if I ran marathons. <laughs> I've got no plans on doing it, but I'm going to enjoy a big helping of pasta tonight just in case, you know, just in case I end up wanting to run a marathon. <laughs> okay. uh, you've been great. This has been so much fun. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Ryan. If you're curious about the customer experience of a particular company, or you'd like to hear us speak with another thought leader in customer experience, send your request to keepsmiling at sellersmile.com, and we might feature them on a future episode. To find the show notes, which include links to the resources and articles we discussed, go to sellersmile.com forward slash 018. If you found this conversation valuable, hit subscribe, and you'll get the next conversation straight to your device. Thanks again, and keep smiling.